I think I want to start by uh, definitions, my, making sure that we're all in the same place in discussing what stranded assets in this conversation are about. Uh, stranded assets are very familiar to the energy business right across the world. There are stranded assets in France, the shale oil, in the Paris Basin. There are stranded assets in the North Sea, fields that have been abandoned with resources still in them. There are stranded assets in Alaska, the gas that has never been developed. And they've, they're mostly, but not all, they're mostly in that place because uh, the economics don't work. They can't be produced commercially. The shale gas in France uh, and the oil is uh, a slightly different category that is in, kept in place because it's not, uh, development is simply not allowed. So stranded assets is a very familiar concept in every energy business. Uh, I think what is being suggested uh, from the climate campaigns is that, and I do challenge this if I have misread what they've said, uh, that you add to that an additional category of oil and gas and coal resources, which should not be developed because enough has been discovered to be produced uh, and to take us right up to the level of the limit at which climate change could be dangerous. Now, we can debate the limit and we can debate the detail of that, but I think that that is the basic thesis. And the thesis therefore suggests that further exploration for uh, energy is unnecessary because enough has been found, uh, that some of the assets that have already been found won't be developed and are therefore valueless because to develop them would take you over the numerical line. And therefore that some of the companies who are holding those assets are overvalued because they include those assets in their valuations. Uh, this therefore provides, and again, do stop me if I'm misinterpreting this, this suggests an economic argument which supports the moral case and the political case for disinvestment from the energy business. And I take that, reading The Guardian and, and other papers, and, and, and not just, I don't mean that in a negative way. Uh, re, that is the line of argument. And the question is, uh, is the logic behind that valid or not? Uh, in my view, it's not, and I don't say that as a climate denier, I'm not. I don't say it because I want to argue about the details of the calculation. We can have that conversation, but I, I, I'm not doing that. I think that the three assumptions on which this is based need to be examined in real detail. The first of those assumptions is that carbon capture and storage or any other technology which could allow you to continue using uh, any, any, any hydrocarbon, but particularly coal and, and gas, is not going to be available at a sufficient scale in a timely manner in order to make that possible. That's the first assumption. The second assumption is that there are going to be alternative energy resources available to the world, to consumers, to switch from as they switch out of oil, gas, and coal. And those are going to be available in an affordable form in a timely manner. That is the second assumption. The third assumption, I think, is that governments across the world will enact the legislation, the regulations, the carbon price, whatever else, whatever other mechanisms, to uh, force people effectively to make that shift because it's unlikely to be made in a voluntary way, so those regulations are needed, they'll be different in different countries, but that has to be done, again, in a timely fashion. So let's take the three assumptions. The first one on carbon capture and storage, I completely agree with those who say that it is not going to work on the scale 
uh, in the time required. The IEA study of CCS a few years ago said that we would need 300 plants by 2020, and I think it's 3,400 for memory by 2050. I, do, I just do not believe that that is going to happen. Very few have been started. Most of those are attached to enhanced oil and gas recovery schemes, which I don't think is quite the intention. Uh, there is still uh, active campaigning against CCS because of the risk of uh, leakage. Uh, I, so I accept that assumption. That's, that's point one. The second question is whether there are uh, sufficient alternative forms of energy, clean energy, low carbon, zero carbon, which are available to replace the existing hydrocarbons that are being used. And on that, I'm very doubtful. Now we can argue about the time scale in which this is going to happen, uh, the whole in which this problem should be debated. We can argue about whether that time scale could be extended for a few years by shifting from coal to gas, to sort of the arguments of a transition phase. But I think in general, the, the basic point is still valid. I do not believe that there are alternative energies available on the scale and at the price that is needed for this to be a reality. I think we will see action. I think we will see a shift in some countries. I think that uh, some parts of the energy business, of the renewable business, are becoming cheaper, but they're not, it's not progressing quickly enough for that to be a reality. And I think that that is particularly true. I've just been one of the authors of the International Energy Agency study of energy in India, which will be published in November. And the scale of the need there for something that can replace coal is dramatic. It's bigger than I had realized, particularly if the Indian government succeeds in getting its double digit growth, which it is aiming for and needs to get people out of poverty. The challenge in India is that uh, the people who are using energy more and more are the poorest. They are the people just coming out of poverty. And they cannot afford expensive alternatives. And that, I think, is going to be a great barrier. So I am very doubtful, unfortunately, on whether that assumption is going to be valid. The third assumption is whether uh, governments around the world will take the steps necessary to make the transition away from hydrocarbons happen. And I think my answer on that is that I am very doubtful. And indeed, I don't believe it. I think it, it would be a strong, very optimistic assumption to assume that we do that in Europe. We have lots of targets, there's no shortage of targets in Europe, but there's no carbon price, which is the one mechanism that would make individuals and companies and energy users make the shift. There's no carbon price, the carbon price is at rock bottom. I don't believe that that is going to be corrected quickly, but let's assume for the purpose of this argument that over time Europe, because it's so concerned about climate change, because there is such a drive from Germany and elsewhere, that Europe does come together and does it, does something serious. The US, well, President Obama has finally come to imposing regulations to change the one part of the energy business, which is coal use in the power generating sector. That's good. It's a step in the right direction. But I think it is very, very vulnerable to political change. And for, to believe that that is going to shift the US away from hydrocarbons, and there are people here I know who know far more about the US than I do, you have to assume that one government after another, one president after another is going to pursue the same policies and more. And looking at the Republican Party in the US, that is a pretty heroic assumption. And then I think 
China, and Isabel knows far more about what's happening in China than I do. I think China will do a lot on climate and is doing a lot and will do a lot of research on renewables. But I still think that looking over 20 or 30 years, coal is going to be the dominant source of energy in the Chinese economy. If that changes, if, if I'm wrong, I hope I'm wrong. I think there are people in China who would like to see that change, but I don't quite believe it yet. In India, as I've said, it's right back to an issue of economics and growth. If you look at all the numbers, everybody's forecast, growth in India is coal-based. So that is a rather negative view. It brings me to the conclusion that there aren't going to be stranded assets. If you look at the long-term forecasts published by by the companies, by the World Bank, by the International Energy Agency, by people right across the spectrum. Not all uh, climate deniers at all. Uh, hydrocarbons still have about 70% of the primary energy market in 2040 and are still growing. So renewables grow and I hope they grow even faster but they still have less than 15% uh, of the market in almost all those forecasts by 2040. And therefore, since the world doesn't end in 24, I hope it doesn't, <laughs> the use of hydrocarbons then will continue. It is beginning at that point to peak. You are going to see a change, I think, in the mixture between one hydrocarbon and another. I think coal is the dominant hydrocarbon of the next 25 years, which is not a positive message. I think oil is peaking and will not go over 100 million barrels a day. And gas is constrained by all the challenges of transportation and uh, getting it from where it is to the market. So I think there'll be a shift from or away from oil be, uh, because people are using less in many countries around the world and because the politics of getting it out of the Middle East and Russia are too complex for people to deal with, but coal is cheap and plentiful and readily available and will be, unfortunately, the fuel of choice in the emerging market economies which are the dominant driver of energy demand around the world. So, I don't want to finish on, a, on, on such a negative note. I think the stranded assets argument is wrong, but I think it's very instructive because it shows us, if you take it, if you deconstruct it in that way, it shows you what needs to be done. Uh, and the climate debate should be absolutely serious rather than just rhetorical. If we want to find a solution, the only answer is to find something that is both low cost and low carbon which can penetrate into the developing market economies like India. Not because people are told to use it, not because they pay extra to use it, but because they pay less to use it. It changes the market. And then I think if you did have that, you would have a lot of stranded assets. And the companies, and I work for one, and I know several of the others are very pragmatic and they would move very quickly from one technology to another. Some assets will be stranded, but many of those big companies, because they have the global reach, would pick up the new technology and use it and uh, thrive in doing so. So I think the challenge for people who are concerned about the climate is the scientific drive to find this low cost, <coughs> low carbon alternative, rather than the global deal argument, which I compare to the League of Nations. Endless talks, endless resolutions passed, endless targets, nothing changed through the 1920s. I was just reading the excellent new book on the League of Nations, which I, I recommend. I don't think that's the way to go. I think we need a scientific drive, technological drive to find this. My, there are numerous things that are going on. 
My bet, and I'm not a scientist, would be on the combination of solar, where I see the costs radically coming down, plus electricity storage, where I think great work is being done in some of the US universities, but it's not there yet. I think that should be the real driving project. I hope it can be done. Uh, I'm an optimist. If it can't be done, I think conferences like this should be talking about adaptation to uh, an increasing, uh, increasingly carbonized world. Thank you very much.